Welcome to our discussion of a very interesting and pastorally significant passage from Paul's letters, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Today we, uh, so to say, get to take our hermeneutic out on a test drive, because even though um, you know, we'll be learning a lot of things about this particular passage. The larger goal of this presentation is to illustrate the Reformed hermeneutic, how we look at any passage, and today we're looking at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, but how we look at any passage from a grammatical, literary, historical, and theological perspective. Before we turn to those different approaches, we first look at where our passage fits into the context as a whole, and then also read the text as we begin. You can see from the chart here, and you can remember perhaps from our discussion of Pauline letter structure, that Paul's thanksgivings foreshadow. They anticipate major topics to be, to be developed later in the body of the letter. And so not surprisingly, the topic and the passage we're looking at, namely the end times and specifically what happens to deceased believers when Jesus uh, comes again, that topic is indeed foreshadowed already in the opening of the letter in the Thanksgiving section. It's foreshadowed, first of all, in verse 3, where Paul takes his normal triad of faith, hope, and love, and he rearranges them so that the last item is emphasized or stressed and so in the Corinthian letter, that's where we often know this uh, triad from, faith, hope, and love, that order. But here in Thessalonians, in verse 3, he talks about remembering your work of faith, number one, and your labor of love, number two. And then in the third and climactic position, he talks about your steadfastness of hope. And it's a hope directed in our Lord Jesus Christ. And this hope isn't just a kind of generic hope in Jesus, like Jesus gives me hope. No, this is in this letter, and in light of the discussion of the passage we're about to look at, this is a specific hope in the fact that one day Jesus will come back and he will um, uh, rescue us uh, from the coming wrath. And that, that theme is exactly foreshadowed also in verse 10 of the Thanksgiving section. So chapter 1, verse 10 reads, and to wait for his Son from the heavens, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, the one who rescues us from the coming wrath. And so you find not only in 3, but even more explicitly in verse 10, in the Thanksgiving section, a clear foreshadowing of the topic of Jesus' second coming, which we're looking at now. So let's begin first with a reading of the text. I read to you, I think, a version that comes from the old NIV. It goes like this. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Well, that's what the text says. Let's spend some time looking at what the text means. And what that means for us is, first of all, we're going to put on our grammatical hat. Or to put it differently, we're going to open our exegetical toolbox and we're first going to focus in on grammatical kind of questions and considerations. Now, in other words, we don't say, it's all Greek to me. We don't say, you know, this is only something for a few Greek geeks like Waimo or some egghead professor types. No, we recognize that every translation involves interpretation. That translation I just read, I, I had to almost stop myself. I had to force myself to keep on reading because there are a lot of verses where I would have said it differently or there are a lot of verses where a, a fuller explanation is needed to clarify what's going on. And again, even if we can't do it ourselves, it would be great if we could do this Greek analysis on our own, but even if we can't, the idea is, is that we surround ourselves with uh, not a cloud of witnesses, but a good cloud of witnesses, that is resources that can help us do this thing. 
So that might mean the Logos computer program, that might mean a commentary, but in other words, we're going to have uh, voices that help us identify what the Greek text tells us that we can't learn from English alone. I'm not going to overstate the case and say that every verse, you know, you can learn something really important by looking at the Greek. That's not always the case. But it is true that there are many important things that uh, we learn or discover by looking at the original language of the text, and you can't see those things from the translation, whether it be in English or in any other modern language. And so let's look at a number of things about this passage that we learn uh, from the grammar that illustrate the importance of this grammatical approach. So the first question has to do with verse 13 and the Greek verb koimao, koimao. And that verb means to sleep. And there's a danger here that people will take it uh, literally, right? Uh, and Paul is not writing about Christians in Thessaloniki who are nodding off during a letter that from Paul that maybe they find uh, boring, you find out pretty quickly if you did a word study on this verb, koimao, that Paul uses it as a euphemism, that is a softer or more friendly way of referring to death. It's not surprising because we do the same thing uh, today. Today, too, we have a hard time often referring to somebody who has just died. That sounds too strong, too harsh, and so we say it in a softer way. We say, you know, so-and-so has passed away. So-and-so is no longer with us. You can see the same phenomena in the obituary column. Maybe you're younger than me and you don't ever look at the obituary column, but when you get older, uh, you, you start looking at people's lives, how old they were and what they did. And Anyway, someone joked a while ago that, um, say there might be 15 names in the obituary column, but only three of them have actually died, right? The other 12 have gone to be with glory or are with the Lord or something like that. And so even today too we try to avoid the harsh word death and we use other words as euphemisms for it. Now there's a danger here and it's a real danger because this is a problem that still is at work in the church. Some people naively read these texts and they see sleep, sleep, sleep three times in our passage and they say, aha! That's what happens to Christians when they die. Their soul goes to sleep. So this idea of soul sleep, that when you die, your soul just kind of knocks off and then wakes up again, you know, when Jesus comes again. And it is, unfortunately, a widely held view still today. Not so long ago, I was leading a seminar for pastors, and there was a pastor there who ministered in an old age home. So that's a unique crowd, but he's dealing with people, obviously, who are facing their own death or the death of their spouse or their loved ones. And he shared with me that about 70% of his congregants, the people in his home to whom he ministered, 70% of them uh, had this idea of soul sleep. And so there is no justification in our text here or anywhere else in the Bible for the idea of your soul just somehow, you know, drifting off into sleep. Instead, now the term we use for this, that is what happens from the time you die to the time you're resurrected, it's called the intermediate state. The scriptures don't say a lot, unfortunately, about it, but you can see there are a few texts that do, and those few texts that do talk about a conscious presence with Christ, a blessed conscious presence with Christ. And so um, we ought not wrongly look at the text and these three references to sleep and interpret it either in an overly literal way or in a metaphorical way that wrongly would be used to support an errant theology, namely the idea of soul sleep. Instead, these are three just softer ways of referring to people who have died, and Paul's not afraid to do that either because later on in the text he does simply talk about those who have died in Christ. Another example is found in verse 13, and it has to do with the verb to grieve, to grieve. And if you parse this out, either on your own or with the help of resources, you would see that this is a present tense subjunctive. Now, most of us, when we hear the word present tense, we say, okay, that's a tense word, and we equate it with referring to time. But in the Greek language, and I hope that this has been taught clearly to you, tense does not always equal 
time. It sounds confusing, but tense doesn't always equal time. In the indicative mood, it does. In the indicative mood, the mood of reality, if you have a present tense, it refers to a present time. If you have a past tense, aorist or imperfect, it refers to a past time. But if you're not in the indicative mood, if you're in any of the other moods, then tense doesn't equal time, but it still does mean something. It refers to verbal aspect. Or if you want a more impressive term in German, it refers to axions art, the kind of action. And all that to say is that when Paul uses the present tense subjunctive here, and it's a verb of grieving, that says to me that it has nothing to do with time. He's not talking about past grieving as opposed to future grieving as opposed to present grieving. No, the present here is stressing the action of the grieving and maybe even stressing the ongoing or continuous nature of the grieving. In other words, when I'm trying to understand the situation here, I see Paul recognizing that the Thessalonians didn't have just a little boo-hoo, oh, we got some people over here who have died, let's move on to other things. No, no, there was a deep grief that they were experiencing. Or to say it differently, the problem in the text will be not so much ignorance, lack of knowledge, than it is grieving. Or to say it even differently, what I see Paul doing here in this passage isn't so much teaching these Christians about the end times. It wasn't like they failed their eschatology class and Paul is really concerned that they know and they learn the right doctrines or teachings. No, Paul is writing to a group of Christians who are grieving. And the present tense stresses that this was a deep or sustained or ongoing grief. And so Paul in this passage is trying to pastor, trying to comfort these grieving Christians. And so the present tense, is, I shouldn't overstate it, but in a significant way it says some important things about what's going on in the Thessalonian church and what Paul is trying to accomplish in this passage. Another example from verse 14 has to do with the little word if, the little word if. In the Greek language, it's the particle a, and that's not our Canadian friends talking, that's ei, the little particle that introduces a um, conditional clause. We call if sentences conditional clauses, and there are three of them in the Greek language, not surprisingly called first class, second class, and third class. Sometimes they have other names, but for our purposes now, we'll just say that what we have here in our text in verse 14 is a first class condition. It's the particle A plus the indicative mood. And the force of the first class conditional clause is a speaker is ifing something, hypothesize something, but they're assuming that it's true. I'll give you an analogy in English, uh, first an ambiguous one and then clarifying it. Let's imagine you just heard, you walked into my wife and me and you heard my wife say, Honey, if you're going to the store, buy me some milk. Now from that sentence alone, frankly, you don't know whether I'm going to the store or not. I might be or I might not be, and you don't know for sure if my wife knows if I'm going to the store. However, let's imagine that just before you came in, I said to her, Bernice, I'm going to the store. And then you walked in and heard her say, Honey, if you're going to the store, buy me some milk. Well, now that if in English has a different connotation. So when she says, if you're going to the store, she's saying, if you're going to the store, and I know for sure that you are, right? Because I just heard you tell me that you were. In fact, instead of saying, if you're going to the store, she could have said, since you're going to the store. Well, it's this kind of if clause that we meet here in verse 14. Paul says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and he says, and I'm assuming that we do believe this. And that's why the RSV and the new RSV have added the word since instead of if. And the NIV has gone one step further. They've taken it all the, the conditional aspect out of the sentence and turned it into a declarative statement. They just simply say, we believe. And there's some advantages and disadvantages to that. But the important part is, if you didn't get the conditional clause right, you might get on a wrong trail as to trying to figure out what Paul is doing. If you came along and said, oh, Paul says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and you say, oh, maybe the Thessalonians don't believe that Jesus died and rose again. I guess that's what Paul's doing. He's trying to convince them that Jesus not only died, but he rose again. He's trying to teach the resurrection in this passage. Well, you would be clearly on the wrong track, because exactly the opposite. Paul is assuming that they know the resurrection. He begins his argument by saying, if, and I know that we do, 
believe that Jesus died and rose again, and then he spells out the consequences of that assumption in the rest of the verse. Another example of what Greek can tell you that you can't get from English alone. Also in verse 14a, we get the idea or the possibility that Paul may be quoting a confession of the early church. You hopefully aren't surprised with this idea that Paul in his letters may not be speaking his own words, but might be quoting a creed or a confession or some kind of traditional statement. We saw that perhaps already in uh, the earlier videos when we dealt with the letter opening of Romans. How Paul to an unknown audience, somewhat skeptical about his... Uh, his theology and Paul quotes deliberately a confession of the early church at the beginning of the letter to kind of win over the trust and confidence of his Roman readers. And there are good reasons to believe that Paul is doing something similar here in uh, our passage from 1 Thessalonians as well. The first reason, there are four of them, the first reason really isn't the strongest, but we might as well mention it because we meet it right away, and that is the phrase, we believe that. It doesn't have to, but in other places it does sometimes introduce a confessional statement, and so that's one suggestive evidence. The second reason is actually pretty weighty. It sounds surprising, but it is true. Paul hardly ever refers to Jesus as Jesus. That's right. Paul hardly ever refers to Jesus as plain old Jesus. Paul has other words, other terms that he uses to refer to Jesus. His favorite term by far is kurios, Lord. And so then it's either the Lord or the Lord Jesus or the Lord Jesus Christ, but Paul rarely refers to Jesus as Jesus. And that's another reason why when Paul refers to Jesus alone here, that's a suggestion that, well, maybe he's not speaking his own vocabulary, his own words, but he may be quoting something. The third reason is also pretty powerful and has to do with his verb choice. Because when Paul talks about Jesus rising from the grave, when he talks about the resurrection of Jesus, Paul loves to use the verb egero. And you can see 33 times. That's his favorite verb. That's his normal verb for referring to the resurrection of Christ. But here in this verse, we meet the unusual verb for Paul, anistomy, anistomy. And so, uh, again, you have to ask now, maybe Paul is just doing something different here, and that's all it is. Or, maybe Paul has a different word here because it's not really his wording, his vocabulary, but he's quoting from a confession of the early church. And the fourth reason, I think, is somewhat significant. Um, if you read Paul carefully when he talks about the resurrection of Jesus, Paul never has Jesus rising by himself. Jesus doesn't raise himself up by his own bootstraps and kind of save himself or resurrect direct himself. It's always God raises Jesus. And so the fact that that's missing in this verse is a bit puzzling, but could be explained by the fact that Paul is not writing his own words, but he's again quoting a confession of the early church. Now the important part here is not so much whether or not it's a confession, but if it is, what might be the significance of that, right? You might be saying, big deal, whoopee ding dong, so what, he's quoting a confession. Well, I hope that you see what the big deal is. You can see that this adds weight to Paul's words, right? He's not just saying, as we often do nowadays, I just feel, or it seems to me. No, he's pulling out some pretty significant ammunition here for his first major point in the passage. He's saying, Wait a minute, um, you and I believe, and not just you and I, but the whole church believes and confesses the truth that Jesus died and rose again. And you get that again by looking at the vocabulary, which you more naturally do in the original language under the first principle grammatical analysis. A good example of this principle from verse 15 is in the emphatic future negation. You hardly ever get in Greek two negatives. Remember, there's the ou negative and the me negative, and they have different purposes and uh, uses in the Greek language. You rarely find them together, smack dab beside each other, and so they're fairly easy to see, but Paul hardly ever uses them, and then when he does, they are clearly emphatic. In fact, it's the strongest form of negation in the Greek language. And so when Paul says in verse 15, we who are living, right, who are alive till the coming of the Lord, will u may proceed, right? You can't just translate that in a more neutral fashion, like we will simply not proceed. You have to add emphasis. Paul says, we will certainly not. We will absolutely not. We will by no means. And a good question we'll ask later is, why is Paul being so emphatic here? Why is he stressing this point? Is it because some people there did believe uh, 
that the ones who are living and alive when Jesus comes again would be ahead and in a more advantageous position over those Christians who had fallen asleep or who had died. Verse 17 is an important verse, especially if you're excited about this idea or thinking called the rapture. Because this is, in my mind, the only verse, and certainly the clearest verse in the Bible, that potentially talks about the rapture, the sudden snatching, to quote the Greek verb, harpazo, the sudden snatching of the church, supposedly by Jesus, to heaven. And I'm just throwing that out here because um, this is another example of grammar, but it's a complicated issue, and I want to treat it not only from a grammatical point of view, but also from an historical one and theological one. And so I push that to a last discussion in this series on 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. One more example before we close out this first uh, hermeneutical principle, this first grammatical analysis part, and that's verse 18. And if you look at the verb that Paul uses there, parakaleo, I want to highlight something about that verb, parakaleo. Now hopefully you hear something familiar already when I say that parakaleo, because earlier we talked about um, this being a certain kind of formula, a transitional formula. We called it the appeal formula, where Paul isn't heavy-handed and says, I command you, but instead uses the softer, more user-friendly, I appeal to you. And that's the same verb, parakaleo. Now, the verb parakaleo can have two nuances, two different meanings or senses. One is the sense that uh, I just referred to in that appeal formula. So it has a sense of authoritative appeal, because when Paul appeals to a church to do something, that's Paul an apostle with a sense of his authority, not demanding, but nevertheless still appealing the church to act in a particular way. And so the word parakaleo can have the sense of authority, soft, user-friendly, yes, but a sense of authority as one person appeals to another person to do something. But the word parakaleo can also have a different nuance than that. And if you take the word parakaleo, it's a compound verb that means it's made up of two parts. So you have the kaleo part, which means to be called. And then you're left with the preposition para, which means to be beside, or near, or next to. And in the Gospel of John, we have the references, a number of them, to the Holy Spirit, who's called the paraclete. Paraclete. That is, somebody who is called to our side. And what it means is we don't go through life alone, but then we have one, namely the Holy Spirit, who is called to our side. And that would be then comforting. Comforting to know that we are not by ourselves, right? We don't have to rely on our own abilities and strength and ingenuity, but we have the Holy Spirit who is called to our side. And that's why some translations in the Gospel of John take the Greek word paraclete, referring to the Holy Spirit, and they translate it as the comforter. All that to say is that the word, or the verb, uh, parakaleo, can not only have the sense of authority, right, appeal you to do something, but can also have the sense of comfort. And I'm stressing that because that reinforces the point we already observed earlier in verse 13 with regard to their grieving. Paul's primary purpose in this passage is not to teach the Thessalonian Christians the right doctrine about the end times because they didn't know the right things. No, the primary problem in the passage is that they are grieving. They are deeply upset over fellow believers who have died, and they're worried whether those Christians will participate fully and equally in the glory of Jesus' return. And so Paul takes the problem of their grieving, and by the end of the passage here in verse 18, he concludes, and and, and, and the NIV has encouraged one another. I think that's a little wimpy in light of this consoling function of parakala. Oh, I think it can be better translated, and it is that way in some translations. Comfort one another. Uh, in English, the word comfort has a deeper sense of the pastoral concern. I mean, if you're going through a hard time, you're just feeling a little depressed, I might, you know, I say, hang in there, I can encourage you. But that's different if somebody close to you has died and you're deeply grieving and I try to console or comfort you. And uh, way too many pastors misuse this passage from 1 Thessalonians. They turn it from a passage in which Paul pastors the church into a passage in which Paul predicts the future. 
And so this is a warning from a couple of these verses already, and we'll hear this again as we work through this passage. This is a warning not to rip this passage out of context and to twist Paul's purposes. Right? You can't put a big sign outside of your church or take an ad out in the paper and say, oh, we've got an end time seminar at our church. You might get a lot of people, but you would be misusing uh, this text. Well, we've come to the end of our first hermeneutical principle, that of the grammatical element. We'll take a short break and we'll put on our other exegetical hat or use our other exegetical tool. Next up will be a literary approach.